back and forth between Ms. Cochran, uh, Corcoran, and Mr. Love, it, it, it's almost, it sounds to me in my, maybe this is my mediator hat, but it sounds like we have a lot of really good distributors in the room and a couple of good manufacturers and you guys just need to do a deal with each other. You, you just you just need to find, but, but it sounds like you actually roughly agree with each other that the individuals in the population have a low, that, that we're talking about, have a very, very low amount of income. So you, if the marginal cost of each quantity is zero, anything greater than zero would be selfishly profitable for you to pick up off the table. And you could just do a deal with each other. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is, as I've asked each of the other panels, if you could talk more in the post-hearing submissions about what efforts there were uh, or are uh, to uh, offer volumes at low prices, what efforts uh, uh, there have been to um, facilitate or frustrate arbitrage when those low prices have been offered, and what efforts there have been to facilitate or frustrate public shaming. Uh, So-called, hey, if, you're, if, if in fact you've now confessed marginal cost is zero and you're given that guy zero, I won zero too. I mean, if everyone gets zero, then there's no financing. So, so the, the question for everybody is, for example, would Médecins Sans Frontiers support uh, a system in which um, uh, uh, IP owners gave the IP away to for free to the very people you're asking about, and then Médecins Sans Frontiers uh, uh, stood up and said, uh, we're against international arbitrage, and we actually are against uh, public shaming of companies who charge different prices to different markets. We're in favor of different prices to different markets. It, Otherwise, it sounds like we just are hearing two very, very different conversations, and it's hard to integrate them together. Um, certainly, any 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 thoughts you'd like to offer today are welcome. But if, if you can follow up in writing and back it up with evidence, we would love to see it because that empowers us to write the reports. Please. Uh, just give you like one real thing that's playing out right now is a hepatitis C drug, the one that uh, 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 Rogi mentioned. It's a it's a thousand dollars a pill. You have to take eighty four pills. It's just registered. It's a fabulous drug. It's an actual cure for hepatitis C. A lot of drugs don't really cure the thing. They just kind of maintain it. This is an actual cure. So how do you think about that for the United States? Because this, you know, it's it's a very effective drug, which is positive. Okay, so we have. In the United States, according to the CDC, 3.2 million persons that are infected with hepatitis C. So the cost of buying $84,000 a person for 3.2 million people in the United States is $268.8 billion. Now, I don't think the United States is going to allocate $268 billion to buy that drug from Gilead. Uh, you can buy Gilead for that amount of money probably. But uh, what's going to probably happen is a small number of people are going to probably get access to the drug, some of the more acute patients, which means you won't stop the new infection rates because it's an infectious disease. There's 150 million people affected worldwide. It seems to me that's a good candidate to buy out the patent so you can price the drug at marginal cost but negotiate some multi-billion dollar purchase of the patent rights from Gilead. So the price can be marginal cost, but Gilead gets a nice profit for having developed a very good drug. So patent buyouts, is that the... I would say patent buyout for that particular drug, yeah, absolutely. And I think if you don't do it, you're going to miss an opportunity to really, really drive hep C back into the Stone Ages. Briefly, go ahead with you. Yeah, we, we support paying for R&D, but what we don't think you have to do is um, basically extract a, a pound of flesh from, from the patients. It's, it's ultimately, there are many structures that we're actually supporting today. Again, um, licenses for AIDS drugs. We want to see these drugs get into countries. We also want to see revenues come back to the industry. And we're seeing a lot of companies step forward and actually say that they're willing to work within the system because they recognize that bringing down the cost of the drug to its marginal cost to generic competition is the best way for them to operate in these markets. The problem we're facing today is that we are having to go disease by disease. So we are engaged today on hepatitis C, for instance, because we know the impacts this will have on our patients. 
our ability to get companies to do this ultimately relies upon the public and moral pressure as well as government will to take these actions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I was, one thing that has not been mentioned is the generic industry in the U.S. And I don't know how big it is and whether or not it tries to sell in India and what are the effect of some of the issues that we've been talked about in terms of those sales. Maybe they're not selling here, so I don't know, but is anyone now? Some of the companies are the same companies, like, uh, uh, I mean, Mylon is a, both the, I think they're headquarters in the United States. Actually. And they bought up Matrix. Yeah, and, and um, uh, they, they bought one of the major suppliers of generic uh, APIs is now, is now an American firm, actually. And uh, uh, I think that if you, the globalization of the, of the generic sector, Nervatus is buying generic manufacturers, a lot of different companies are in the generics business themselves. Um, uh, uh, about in, in the United States, as you know, about 80% of prescriptions are generic drugs by, 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 by volume, not by, not by dollars, but like, the, you know, we're probably, we're like really way up there in terms of the use of generics, but it's a, it's a global industry. The thing is, is that the, the APIs are, are often made in China or in India, uh, the production APIs. of drugs, uh, often, often in, in India. Active pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay, like thanks. All those generic and branded. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay. But I was just wondering if someone has mentioned that. And that's any uh, idea that the employment in the U.S. Most has most sector versus the pharmaceuticals. How, how, how a lot of these companies got in trouble is that they is that they they outsourced their manufacturing to India. Costs were lower. It, it, India had. They had no patents since 1970, and, they, and they, they had, like, people would work for it. Like, Mr. Shah, who was here yesterday, uh, on Wednesday, he used to work for Pfizer. Yeah. That was a common thing. People would work for a company, then they walk across the street and set up their own firm. They knew what to do. And, uh, and but, but that happened decades ago. And so now you have, now it's almost the reverse. Now there's more people that know how to make drugs in India, and they're better at it than they are in the United States. So people go to India because they're, all these companies, including Bayer and other companies, they have, they have business relationships with Indian companies to make their products, just like we make uh, Apple makes its products in you know in, in, in Asia and things like that. So I think there's a lot of outsourcing that take, a, a technical capacity that takes place, and it's very different for biologics as it is for small molecules. So small molecules is a fairly highly competitive thing in the biologics, which is really now the big high price sector, high margin sector, much uh, much more challenging actually. I'd just like to make a follow-up comment. It's more actually kind of a twist on your question, and I'm not an economist, so I might defer, but another way to look at it, whether it's the um, hepatitis C drug, or even the fact that we have a growing population that is dealing with Alzheimer's, <coughs> is the cost to patients and the cost to society right now. And what is that? And what is the value of a drug that can diminish those costs that they've either incurred or we will incur as a society too? So I think there's a flip side to that that um, I would encourage evaluated. And looking at that cost, what role does insurance play? And thinking about how much does it cost a patient, right? Because there's a big difference between, no, you, you ever you, I mean, I'm not an insurance company, so they, they'd probably be better to answer that question. I think that the companies can't charge high prices without insurance. And I think that you know, there's a big movement right now, and, and, and everybody wants it. Everybody wants to see more insurance. Latin America has moved pretty far in the area of insurance. I would say India is not so far, but if you have to look at their population and how diverse it is, it's quite challenging in India. But you see quite a few countries, they start with some kind of a public sector system with a, a two-tier system where they have like, a, like Thailand has it, they have a top 20 or a private system, bottom 80 or in kind of a public system. Public system benefits are not as good as a top sector. The, the Thai compulsory license, which one of your commissioners written extensively about, the license only applied to the public sector. It didn't apply to the private sector because they were trying to segment the country, uh, the compulsory license within the market. They felt the top 20 didn't need the compulsory license, but they thought the bottom 80 did. And I think that uh, people are struggling with what, not just with compulsory licensing, but with voluntary licensing, with price discrimination, with public partner pri pressure. There's like a million things people are trying to figure out. What do you do when you have people to make 27 cents a day up to Bill Gates' income and in between? And how do you kind of make that work? And that's why I think the delinkage thing is appealing to people because once you 
cut, cut the cord between the price of the drug and the R&D financing, it's much easier to scale the contributions to R&D. I agree with Bayer that the value of new drugs, of innovation, is undervalued worldwide, and that, that there should be more resources going in to innovation for new drugs. But what I don't agree with Bayer is that serving 200 patients in India for a liver cancer drug is an acceptable outcome. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shapiro, you mentioned various indicators of IP rights in your testimony. In your opinion, which of the best capture current realities on the ground in India? Um, um, I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, you mentioned the various indicators of IP rights in your testimony. Yes. And so I was wondering, which of the best capture current realities on the ground in India and in other countries? And if you want to do both here, you can. Right. No, I, th there are um, certainly a lot of ways of measuring intellectual property rights. Um, I think the uh, most objective index um, of, among the indexes that have been developed is the Gennardi Park Index, uh, which was the first one I cited. It was, so I said it was developed by staff at the World Bank and at American University. It's used internationally. Uh, it gives up, it's quite, it has five different categories, dimensions of intellectual property rights that it tries to capture. Um, it's updated pretty regularly. Um, the, um, uh, my interest in the index and the interest that I'm trying to uh, impress upon you is um, the large economic benefits that are associated both in the United States and even more so in developing countries with respect for intellectual property rights. But my, I share the same social impulses that Mr. Love does and that Doctors Without Borders does. Um, what I know as an economist is that if you significantly reduce the uh, extent and breadth of intellectual property protections in pharmaceuticals, you will get much less research, R&D, in pharmaceuticals and the production of these innovative treatments will decline um, unless you're prepared to find a way to replace them. That's the way economics work, that, that's the way incentives work, that's the way corporations behave. Um, I would love to have all these medicines have full access in every country in the world. Somebody's got to pay for it. The question is, at whatever level, the question is, do you pay for it in a way which undermines the incentives to develop the next generation of pharmaceuticals, or you do, do you do it in another way? R&D will continue. It'll just shift out of pharmaceuticals into lots of other industries. As I noted, half the U.S. economy, the value of public companies, of half the sectors in the U.S. economy are now dominated by intellectual capital. So there are lots of other places for it to go, and a lot more people will die if we reduce the incentives to develop the next generation of cancer drugs and hepatitis drugs and so on. Can, 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 I, can I respond to that? Yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the most simplistic piece of propaganda that I, you typically get in one of these meetings, that if you just push on the IPR area, you know, if you don't, you know, people are going to die and we're gonna, innovation's going to stop. Now, it is true qualitatively that more uh, higher prices and stronger monopolies, generally speaking, has a positive impact on the level of investment in R&D. But when you, start to, when you start to break it down and look at how it breaks up in different countries and different, in different contexts, it doesn't tell a very interesting story. And when you look at the under, he didn't even talk about public sector thing. Well, pharma itself lobbied to double the NIH budget because they knew the NIH was a, a really important component of their own success. So I think if you want to look holistically about R&D, you have to get behind this simplistic propaganda okay. that we just heard. Uh, can I just say I resent the personal, the personal character of that characterization. Um, I advise the International Monetary Fund. I advise okay. the I administration. I don't, want to, I don't want to get into this debate. Uh, Everybody that was just for his offensive, the right. offensive right. remarks okay. of Mr. Lowe. We're, we're just trying to figure out how we can do our report here. Um, 
Commissioner Pinker. Commissioner Pinker. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. Um, and, and I'm still trying to understand the, the pricing of the, uh, uh, of the pharmaceuticals in countries uh, like uh, India. And, and I, I, I benefited greatly from uh, Commissioner Keefe's uh, questions and thoughts about, uh, about whether there's an issue of price discrimination, whether the price discrimination it could be arbitraged away, uh, what, what, the, what the issue is. But I'm wondering whether there's another angle that might be explored in the post-hearing, and that is that uh, a pricing model that doesn't seem to make sense in the short term may make sense over a 10 year or 20 year period uh, where the anticipation of the pharmaceutical companies is that the country will become wealthier and therefore be able to pay the higher prices. Can somebody comment on that? Please in the back. Well, just briefly, one, the price differentials may be far too great in the case of many drugs to make that a realistic scenario, but secondly and more importantly, people that need access to those drugs today won't be around in 10 or 20 years, they'll be gone. I, I, think, I understand that from an access point of view, but I'm trying to understand the logic of the people that are, are making these pricing decisions. Mr. Love. Uh, about 10 years ago, Pfizer did a study of middle-income countries, what they were looking at. This was internal. Uh, they had an economist who seconded in the World Bank that talked about this. They looked at uh, countries with $2,000 to $9,000 per capita income, which at the time they defined as middle income. And they asked themselves the question, if we lowered the price, could we increase access? And they found that if they lowered the price, they'd have a five-fold, that was their own internal modeling, a five-fold increase in uptake. But they also decided that they would actually make less money by sending, selling five times as much. And that's because the, the shape of the demand curve was, was, was convex enough. It was like it was enough unequality in the country that selling it to the higher the higher end of population at a high price was more profitable than a larger number of people at the lower price. If you look at the UNDP data on income distributions for quite a few countries, um, you're best off selling to the top 10% and then, and then even the top 20%. So I think that's really the problem. Now if you could segment within the country then you know you might make some progress then, like Thailand has tried to do with the public sector and the private sector and things like that. But if you just talk about a single price within a country, for developing countries with a huge gap between people that make European style incomes and the rest of the population, it's a brutal story. Mr. Hunter. Uh, I'm not sure about all of Mr. Love's um, um, facts on where he gets them, but it is true that in in, in uh, these, uh, the, particularly in major emerging markets, even uh, more so in the least developed countries, the, that there are a lot of other problems other than just prices, the infrastructure, the, the getting, I mean, having the doctors to do uh, the diagnosis and so forth. And I think the Bayer products was um, particularly, this was a particularly acute set of problems that was part of the reason why the, the uh, patient pool was relatively small. The, um, and indeed, a number of the companies have pretty robust um, patient access programs. I understand from a public health perspective for if you're an Indian official or Chinese official, that, that's not a systemic so solution, but these companies, they do live by antitrust, uh, under antitrust disciplines and say can't come up with collective solutions um, as such. The, um, uh, you, you mentioned some very interesting observations about um, uh, price discrimination. And, and sure, that their, their companies have been experimenting with different business models. Um, um, over the past, especially over the past decade, um, there um, and, and indeed with the, uh, work, the number of the companies are working with the Gates Foundations to um, on several um, um, models of uh, Philippines, Peru, and I think was it Ghana is the third one I believe um, where they're trying to do it. Now the challenges are quite substantial because in many cases that these are countries where there's a, a large access need, but you also have weak governmental infrastructure, weak healthcare infrastructure. So these, these problems kind of compound themselves. Um, theoretically, there may be real opportunities um, if you can deal with the, uh, both the information arbitrage, the reference pricing, um, and you know, rich countries in Europe which like to reference prices in other markets, that creates, problem, that creates a, a constraint on the ability of com companies to, to experiment with prices in less well-off countries. Um, and then, of course, the 
product arbitrage, which, we, which you mentioned, um, and which are, are real challenges. And so these are some of the things which I, um, in the Gates um, um, experiments we're um, trying to get at. But it's a logistical, a huge logistical challenge, and, it, and um, it's something that certainly the corporate leadership, and I've heard the CEOs talk about it, it's something that they're seized of and very concerned about, but the challenges are, are quite substantial. And they have to, you know, consistent with antitrust laws, have to, these have to be individual solutions for the companies. Anything you can do in the post hearing uh, to help us understand the pricing model or any experiments that are being conducted with respect to the pricing model, I think that would be very helpful to us. In the back, please. Uh, I'll make uh, a couple quick comments. This is all about setting expectations in the long term for the companies. They want to charge high prices now so they can charge high prices in the future. It, just use their words themselves. They're worried about the contagion effect that other countries will look up and they will say, why would we manage our intellectual property systems this way and simply hand out patents to multinational companies for frivolous things? The European Union themselves looked in their competition commission and found that between 2000 and 2007, because of practices that they discovered in the pharmaceutical industry by raiding their offices, that their consumers paid an additional 2 billion euros in costs for, for medicines. The problem is not only what companies are worried about with other emerging markets, it's also that it could come back to the United States and the European Union when they realize that these costs are unsustainable. In terms of blaming other things and reducing access, yes, it's true. These countries are poor, they have poor healthcare infrastructure, weak healthcare systems, inadequate numbers of doctors and nurses. In many ways, MSF is almost a healthcare system in itself. Uh, when we have to pay very high prices for vaccines or drugs, we can build less clinics, we can train less doctors, we can reach less patients. There's an opportunity cost that we have every time we have to pay a high price for a drug. It's the same for a healthcare system. Every time they have to pay a high price for medicine, even if India was to quadruple their health uh, budget, which they should, if they're just going to pay high prices, that's not going to change uh, uh, the situation for people on the ground. The last thing I would note is sort of the reference to differential pricing or tiered pricing. This isn't working today in developing countries. We already are seeing the problems with this because of the challenges that are being faced in middle income countries with large amounts of poverty. What do we know is a pricing model that works? It's generic competition. It's bringing down the cost of the drug to its marginal cost. Again, we are willing to look at incentives and we support incentives that pay for research and development, but no amount of trying to optimize a differential price in the market, including the experiments being done today in various developing countries, is going to reach all patients who need the drugs. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the panel and I look forward to the post term submissions. Thank you, Commissioner Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm stepping way back with this question. Um, I know that it is a generalization, but the United States is often referred to as an innovative economy. Uh, would you all describe India as an innovative economy? And I realize that this question is difficult to answer, uh, as it's difficult to make general, generalizations as such, but I'm asking it anyway. Uh, as I think this question is to a point an important factor in this afternoon's discussion. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Malkani. I guess the question would be, did we consider Japan to be an innovative economy after World War II? People accused the Japanese of copying everything that was being developed in the West. Or in the late 19th century and early 20th century, the United States was characterized as pirates. The problem here is we're implementing a double standard on developing countries today. Their levels of economic development are substantially lower than those of developed countries and they're being asked to adopt much higher levels of intellectual property protection. Um, Arvind Subramanian has, I think, written on this in the past. This is exactly the problem, is these countries are just now developing, they're just now starting to learn to innovate through copying, just as the United States, just as Japan, just as every other country has done. But they're being told that instead of learning to develop an innovative economy, they should simply, as everyone else is saying here, pay large amounts of revenues to developed countries in terms of high, um, high fees. Um, in terms of patents and, and high prices for medicines, and that's the problem. India is becoming an innovative economy, and I think the real challenge, to be honest, in the future, as, as somebody who's from the United States myself, is what is going to happen, I, I think, in the United States when Indian companies are innovating and selling drugs back into the United States at high prices? Will we now look at a moment like this and say, actually, we need to take these same measures also in order to manage medicine prices because it's a foreign company that's selling products into our market? So would you characterize India as being as going from uh, advancing to becoming an innovative economy? I'm just looking at economic history. Every country learns through copying, and, and, and every other country has been accused of being pirates in the past. The only difference is with the global trading system, there's much more teeth to stop 
countries like India and others from actually taking measures to learn how to innovate. All right, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Love. Yeah, there's, look, the technological innovation is generally a characteristic of advanced economies because they have the scientific and educational infrastructure that supports it because they have the capital formation and in particular because they have intense competitive pressures which drive innovation and particularly which drive innovators to figure out how to um, uh, produce something which will be of broad use. So in effect, innovation, that technological, that, that capacity for technological innovation is um, a feature of modernization. Um, today, modernization in the developing world, it, did, it used to be that the way you created an in innovative and mature industry was you, with trade protection, you protected yourself from competition from abroad while your industry could develop. Uh, that's the way we did it in the 19th century. It's the way Japan did it. It's the way most of Europe did it. There's a new model today, which China really kind of was a, a leader in, and Korea. And that is, um, instead of doing this, open yourself to foreign direct investment, to the transfers of advanced technologies and advanced business organizations that not only drive growth enormously, um, but also uh, have what we call spillover benefits. That is, um, benefits to the society from people learning, have it from uh, people learning how to use these technologies, use advanced business methods, and then taking them and founding their own companies so that you get domestic uh, uh, competitors. This is the Chinese model. Um, Korea has used this. India uses it much less. One of the fundamental reasons she uses it much less is there is a direct relationship between foreign direct investment and intellectual property rights. That's why there is su such a lower level of foreign direct investment in India than in many other comparable countries. Um, and that is a barrier to innovation as a broader economic phenomenon, even though there are certain kind of niche industries in India that have been innovative. Um, very innovative in certain forms of film entertainment, um, uh, uh, innovative in certain areas of software. Um, there are some niches, um, but you know, there's a good reason why 40% of an estimated 40% of Silicon Valley startups include Indian founders uh, because there's been an enormous brain drain from India to the United States and other countries of technological innovators and business innovators in part in order to because the United, well, the United States offers lots of advantages but one of the advantages is the intellectual property rights that go to the founders of those companies not just talking about pharmaceuticals, it's predominantly in other industries. Yes, and Ms. Mapani, I want, I want to hear your, your response, but also did anyone else want to comment, Mr. Love? I just want to put in perspective a little bit about what's going on with the United States as it relates to, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of concerned about India and some other countries. In, in 1982, uh, the, the Patent Cooperation Treaty is, is, is are a good way to look at the most important patents in the world because uh, uh, they're the ones that you intend to file throughout the world, as opposed to, say, the U.S. Patent Office or any national patent office. In 1982, the U.S. was filing 45% of all the PCT patents were coming out of the United States. In 2001, the share was under 40%. By 2009, the share was under 30%. In 2012, the share was 26.4%. What's happened is the United States has had a huge decline in the market share of patents that have been filed around the world. And a lot of the changes have been that middle-income countries and other, other, uh, other countries around the world are now basically moving up in terms of basically doing these kind of things. And so, one, I think it's, it's sort of, uh, it, and the other, other part I want to mention is that, is that not all the innovation is measured um, uh, innovation by patents. In, in terms of the silicon activity or the, the software sector in India and the services, 
sector. The services sector is not well measured in terms of the innovations by the patent system. In the software sector, the most dynamic sector